Once upon a time, we used to think of domestic abuse as purely being someone hitting someone. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, although not exclusive, it was about a man hitting a woman. That's how we used to we used to see it. We know it works both ways and we know domestic violence can extend to other members of the family. But that's how it was once seen. But things have become more nuanced and now we've got social media and what have you. And there are lots of different ways of controlling somebody, keeping them in line. Uh, and so the Crown Prosecution Service has had to continually update uh, their definition of coercive control. Now, the latest one uh, update um, guidance sets out the various sophisticated and subtle ways that suspects can manipulate uh, their partners to exert control over their lives and seek to minimize the likelihood of detection and punishment. Notice as I said subtle. Now, if you were to tell somebody that your partner continuously gives you presents, gifts, Gifts, uh, showers you with all sorts of amazing presents and praise and things like that and then takes those away and then that's usually not done on its own it's difficult one to tell yourself what's going on here when your friends will probably tell you you're lucky and two to extricate yourself from that it's, it's a really complicated issue and so many times you hear people say well if that person was just abusive just leave it's not that easy because the art of manipulation and coercive control is insidious it's it's gradual and it's very, very powerful. Uh, there is but one person to talk about this. Uh, I've had him on the show before. Absolutely amazing. Sam Vaknin, is, who is Professor of Clinical Psychology and a leading authority of, of narcissism, which is, this is all part of that. Sam, thank you so much for, for joining me again. Um, you know, as, as I said before, when we talk about coercive control, it's very difficult for somebody to get their head around it, even if they're in the claws of it, to, to, to know what shape it takes. Now, this love bombing, as I said, so many people say, you're lucky, but just talk us through about what kind of control that is exerting and how it manifests. Good to see you again, Trisha. And no, I'm not love bombing you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's you. just simply good to see you again. Thank you for having me. I'm a former professor. I I, I yeah. get my position. So oh. just for, for disclosure. Thank sake. you. <laughs> um, love bombing, as the name implies, is when you weaponize expression of affection and love and compassion and attention in order with explicit intent to manipulate another person into a behavior which you deem beneficial to you. Right. This should be the definition. Unfortunately, so how does it look, Sam? I was going to say, I'm just trying, how does it, give me some examples of how it might look when you say weaponize. Yeah, uh, but allow me, with your permission, yeah, before, yeah, I, yeah. before I proceed, one disclaimer. Um, we need to define, when we criminalize behaviors, we need to define them really, really, really well. Right. Because if we don't define them really, really, really well and delineate all the nuances with precision, we will end up criminalizing romance. We will end up criminalizing sex. And many, many young men are already terrified to approach yeah. young women because so many aspects of intergender interaction have been criminalized, mm -hmm. I would even say excessively. Yeah. Now, this, this is no exception. Love bombing is, is pathological, dysfunctional, and abusive. It's manipulative. It's an integral part of coercive control. However, if it is not well defined, we may end up criminalizing totally legitimate, lovely, charming, enchanting behaviors between people. Um, and unfortunately, okay. from the little that I've seen, love bombing is wrongly defined with the, in the Crown Prosecution Services documents. Oh, wow. So, yeah. so, so, so what, so what does it look like then? Where are they going wrong? Because as you say, young here, men here, you know, here are, the minimum, are terrified. Yes, here are the minimal elements that should exist in any definition, proper definition. 
of love bombing. First of all, it should be over the top. It should be unbelievable, incredible. No reasonable person would ever accept the contents of love bombing as real or truthful. Number two, it should be premature. In other words, the compliments, the affection, the attention, the gifts should come too fast and too early. Ah. So on the first meeting, you're the most amazing woman in the world. In the second meeting, there's an offer, an offer of marriage. And at the end of the second meeting, you're already planning to have three children together. And you're <laughs> discussing the college funds. Right. That's premature. Number three, it should be ill-founded. The compliments in love bombing have nothing to do with you. So even you feel, as the victim of love bombing, even you feel that something's wrong. You are being described in a way that has nothing to do with you. We call this idealization. The compliments are actually directed at some idealized image of you, which is totally uh, fictional. So love bombing must include a pronounced element of fantasy. In the absence of fantasy, it simply might be a dysfunctional way of courting or a, a flirting gun or eye if there's no fantasy. Fantasy is, is crucial. Number four, love bombing must be a part of a pattern of behavior, misbehavior, known as coercive control. If it is divorced from coercive control, it should not be criminalized. Right. Number five, number five, love bombing should be a part of what we call in psychology intermittent reinforcement. Intermittent reinforcement means you get conflicting messages fast on the hills on the hills of each other. So hot and cold. I love you, I hate you. I want your company, I don't want to talk to you. Let's chat, I'm blocking you. So uh, this is called intermittent reinforcement. It disorients you, you become disoriented. You don't know how to decipher the other person's behavior. You try to please the other person. You become submissive, you're intimidated, and you're manipulated. Intermittent reinforcement is a crucial part of coercive control, and there is no love bombing without intermittent reinforcement. In other words, so you're you're, you're continuously you're continuously trying to keep that person in the the positive sort of thing on their now, toes. The, on their toes. So you said right at the beginning it comes too early. Now I remember going back in my single days. This chap, we'd had. Uh, the, like the first date I was amazing and and uh, all this sort of thing and I was ostensibly there for a completely I'd been invited there for a completely different reason to talk about mental health what have you then you're amazing and what have you and all this sort of thing and then the next thing he's saying I'm trying to figure out this thing which house we're going to live in and I'm like so are you say I mean that was like the second date and you sort of think whoa 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 now, you talked about, the, uh, although that can't be criminalized, to take it from hot and cold and black and white, that would still be a flag, should still be a flag, I'm saying, for anyone in a relationship to be wary. Yes. Am I right? Absolutely. Intermittent reinforcement in the vast majority of cases is a manipulative control instrument. It's intended to control. It's intended to create such uncertainty in your mind it's intended to gaslight you into doubting your own judgment and perception of reality, uh, of the other person's behavior, their motivations, etc., mm. so that you become dependent on the other person's input. He becomes your reality test. You, and so then you lose your independency and agency. You become an extension of that person. And you, because he has the capability to withhold affection from you, to withhold his love, to withhold the pleasant times together, you want to motivate him to give those back to you. And so you try to please him to the point of denying yourself and your needs. Sam, let me, let me throw something at you, Sam, because we're talking about in a, in a, a relationship. Not physically, I hope. <laughs> no, 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 we're talking about in a relationship. I've seen this play out in workplace situations. Of course. And, 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 and work-wise, and that legally and every other way is very difficult to prove. Where a boss right at the beginning is talking about you're amazing, you're this, or da, 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 da. and then the next bit, uh, you know, you're rubbish and you need me, you don't need me calling you at inappropriate times. I'm only calling you at these inappropriate times because I can't do this work without you. And then you did... Can it happen in a workplace situation yes, or am I, think, I? 
Ah. No, I think you're very right. I think two two additional shortcomings of the CPS definition of, of love bombing is limiting it, confining it to intimate romantic relationships mm. when it's absolutely untrue. It can happen in church. It can happen in a workplace. Yes. It can happen yes. between a teacher and a student. It can happen. It, love bombing is a universal, universal manipulative tactic. Second thing, the CPS does not make a distinction between love bombing, which is the outcome of mental illness. For example, people with bipolar disorder, they love bomb in the manic phase. People with borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder love bomb because they can't tell the difference between truth and lies in a fantasy. Mm. People with, uh, with other psychotic disorders, they love bomb because they can't tell the difference between internal and external and so on and so forth. Ah, these people yes. these people are not acting criminally they're just playing out their mental illness yeah and yeah, there's yeah. no such exemption or mitigation in the cps's definition of love bombing that's catastrophic <laughs> that's absolutely wrong and so it's, so uh, i think the key the key is coercive control is yes. the love bombing does the love bombing lead to a coercive control scenario is it embedded in a coercive control strategy or is it an, a totally independent behavior that goes nowhere? If it right. goes nowhere, if it goes nowhere, it's just a warning sign. You wouldn't want to have a relationship with someone who jumps to conclusions in the first meeting. Yeah. If it is, however, if it is embedded in coercive control, it should absolutely be criminalized. I fully agree, because it leads to it's the corridor that leads to coercive control. Now, with your permission. I would like to give the indications of coercive control. It's up to you. Yeah. You're, you're, well, you're we're just we're just about Sam. We're just about to run out of time, and I don't want to have to interrupt you in the middle of that. What I, I and I did this last time because you, you, when I talk to you, it generates so much interest. Uh, can we leave people hanging? Can, would you mind coming back on the show because this is something that awesome. I, I really the whole thing about it being in the workplace as well. I know people are going to be like, "Whoa, they haven't thought about that," and and how the CPS definition needs to be expanded sam we will talk again thank you so My much pleasure. sam, sam vatten in there with some really interesting stuff about coercive control and as i said before we will be talking more about that coming up we've got a, a lot lot more about uh, bringing in legislation that prevents obese people being discriminated against good idea or not that and a lot lot more right after this break so stay with me here on talk tv see you in a moment